John Brown May 9, 1800 to December 2, 1859, was an American abolitionist who believed in and advocated armed insurrection as the only way to overthrow the institution of slavery in the United States. He first gained attention when he led small groups of volunteers during the Bleeding Kansas Crisis of 1856. He was dissatisfied with the pacifism of the organized abolitionist movement. These men are all talk. What we need is action. Action. In May 1856, Brown and his supporters killed five supporters of slavery in the Pottawatomie Massacre, which responded to the sacking of Lawrence by pro-slavery forces. Brown then commanded anti-slavery forces at the Battle of Black Jack June 2nd and the Battle of Osawatomie August 30, 1856. In October 1859, Brown led a raid on the Federal Armory at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, today West Virginia to start a liberation movement among the slaves there. He seized the armory, but seven people were killed, and ten or more were injured. He intended to arm slaves with weapons from the arsenal, but the attack failed. Within 36 hours, Brown's men had fled or been killed or captured by local farmers, militiamen, and U.S. Marines led by Robert E. Lee. He was tried for treason against the Commonwealth of Virginia, the murder of five men, including three blacks, and inciting a slave insurrection, was found guilty on all counts, and was hanged. Historians agree that the Harper's Ferry Raid escalated tensions that led to the South's secession a year later and the American Civil War. Brown's raid captured the nation's attention. Southerners feared that it was just the first of many Northern plots to cause a slave rebellion that might endanger their lives, while Republicans dismissed the notion and claimed that they would not interfere with slavery in the South. John Brown's Body was a popular Union marching song that portrayed him as a martyr. Brown's actions as an abolitionist and the tactics he used still make him a controversial figure today. He is both memorialized as a heroic martyr and visionary, and vilified as a madman and a terrorist. Historian James Lawin surveyed American history textbooks and noted that historians considered Brown perfectly sane until about 1890, but generally portrayed him as insane from about 1890 until 1970 when new interpretations began to gain ground. Early life John Brown was born May 9, 1800, in Torrington, Connecticut. He was the fourth of the eight children of Owen Brown and Ruth Mills and grandson of Capt. John Brown Brown could trace his ancestry back to 17th century English Puritans. In 1805, the family moved to Hudson, Ohio, where Owen Brown opened a tannery. Brown's father became a supporter of the Oberlin Institute in its early stage, but was ultimately critical of the school's perfectionist leanings, especially renowned in the preaching and teaching of Charles Finney and Asa Mahon. Brown withdrew his membership from the Congregational Church in the 1840s and never officially joined another church, but both he and his father were fairly conventional evangelicals for the period with its focus on the pursuit of personal righteousness. Brown's personal religion is fairly well documented in the papers of the Reverend Clarence G., a Brown family expert, now held in the Hudson, Ohio, Library and Historical Society. Brown's father had as an apprentice Jesse R. Grant, father of Ulysses S. Grant. At 16, Brown left his family and went to Plainfield, Massachusetts, where he enrolled in a preparatory program. Shortly afterward, he transferred to the Morris Academy in Litchfield, Connecticut. He hoped to become a congregational minister, but money ran out and he suffered from eye inflammations that forced him to give up the academy and return to Ohio. In Hudson, he worked briefly at his father's tannery before opening a successful tannery of his own outside of town with his adopted brother. In 1820, Brown married Diane the Lusk. Their first child, John Jr., was born 13 months later. In 1825, Brown and his family moved to New Richmond, Pennsylvania, where he bought 200 acres 81 hectares of land. He cleared an eighth of it and built a cabin, a barn, and a tannery. The John Brown Tannery site was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. Within a year, the tannery employed 15 men. Brown made money raising cattle and surveying. He helped to establish a post office and a school. During this period, Brown operated an interstate business involving cattle and leather production along with a kinsman, Seth Thompson, from eastern Ohio. In 1831, one of his sons died. 
Brown fell ill, and his businesses began to suffer, leaving him in terrible debt. In the summer of 1832, shortly after the death of a newborn son, his wife Dianthe died. On June 14, 1833, Brown married 16-year-old Mary Ann Day April 15, 1817 to May 1, 1884, originally from Washington County, New York. They eventually had 13 children, in addition to the seven from his previous marriage. In 1836, Brown moved his family to Franklin Mills, Ohio now known as Kent. There he borrowed money to buy land in the area, building and operating a tannery along the Cuyahoga River in partnership with Zenas Kent. He suffered great financial losses in the economic crisis of 1839, which struck the western states more severely than had the Panic of 1837. Following the heavy borrowing trends of Ohio, many businessmen like Brown trusted too heavily in credit and state bonds and paid dearly for it. In one episode of property loss, Brown was jailed when he attempted to retain ownership of a farm by occupying it against the claims of the new owner. Like other determined men of his time and background, he tried many different business efforts in an attempt to get out of debt. Along with tanning hides and cattle trading, he also undertook horse and sheep breeding, the last of which was to become a notable aspect of his pre-public vocation, in 1837, in response to the murder of Elijah P. Lovejoy, Brown publicly vowed, Here, before God, in the presence of these witnesses, from this time, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. Brown was declared bankrupt by a federal court on September 28, 1842. In 1843, four of his children died of dysentery. As Louis DeCaro Jr. shows in his biographical sketch 2007, from the mid-1840s Brown had built a reputation as an expert in fine sheep and wool, and entered into a partnership with Col. Simon Perkins of Akron, Ohio, whose flocks and farms were managed by Brown and Sons. Brown eventually moved into a home with his family across the street from the Perkins Stone Mansion on Perkins Hill. The John Brown House Akron, Ohio, still stands and is owned and operated by the Summit County Historical Society of Akron, Ohio. Transformative years in Springfield, Massachusetts In 1846, Brown and his business partner Simon Perkins moved to the ideologically progressive city of Springfield, Massachusetts. There Brown found a community whose white leadership—from the community's most prominent churches, to its wealthiest businessmen, to its most popular politicians, to its local jurists, and even to the publisher of one of the nation's most influential newspapers—were deeply involved and emotionally invested in the anti-slavery movement. Brown and Perkins' intent was to represent the interests of the Ohio's wool growers as opposed to those of New England's wool manufacturers—thus Brown and Perkins set up a wool commission operation. While in Springfield, Brown lived in a house at 51 Franklin Street. Two years before Brown's arrival in Springfield, in 1844, the city's African American abolitionists had founded the Sanford Street Free Church now known as St. John's Congregational Church which went on to become one of the United States' most prominent platforms for abolitionist speeches. From 1846 until he left Springfield in 1850, Brown was a parishioner at the Free Church, where he witnessed abolitionist lectures by the likes of Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth. In 1847, after speaking at the Free Church, Douglass spent a night speaking with Brown, after which he wrote, From this night spent with John Brown in Springfield, Massachusetts 1847 while I continued to write and speak against slavery, I became all the same less hopeful for its peaceful abolition. My utterances became more and more tinged by the color of this man's strong impressions. During Brown's time in Springfield, he became deeply involved in transforming the city into a major center of abolitionism, and one of the safest and most significant stops on the Underground Railroad. Brown also learned much about Massachusetts' mercantile elite. While he initially considered this knowledge a curse, it proved to be a boon to his later activities in Kansas and at Harper's Ferry. The business community had reacted with hesitation when Brown asked them to change their highly profitable practice of selling low-quality wool en masse at low prices. Initially, Brown naively trusted them, but he soon realized they were determined to maintain their control of price setting. Also, on the outskirts of Springfield, the Connecticut River Valley's sheep farmers were largely unorganized and hesitant to change their methods of production to meet higher standards. 
In the Ohio cultivator, Brown and other wool growers complained that the Connecticut River Valley's farmers' tendencies were lowering all U.S. wool prices abroad. In reaction, Brown made a last-ditch effort to overcome the wool mercantile elite by seeking an alliance with European manufacturers. Ultimately, Brown was disappointed to learn that Europe preferred to buy western Massachusetts wools en masse at the cheap prices they had been getting. Brown then traveled to England to seek a higher price for Springfield's wool. The trip was a disaster, as the firm incurred a loss of $40,000, of which Perkins bore the brunt. With this misfortune, the Perkins and Brown Wool Commission operation closed in Springfield in late 1849. Subsequent lawsuits tied up the partners for several more years. Before Brown left Springfield in 1850, the United States passed the Fugitive Slave Act, a law mandating that authorities in free states aid in the return of escaped slaves and imposing penalties on those who aided in their escape. In response Brown founded a militant group to prevent slaves' capture, the League of Gileadites. In the Bible, Mount Gilead was the place where only the bravest of Israelites gathered to face an invading enemy. Brown founded the League with the words. Nothing so charms the American people as personal bravery. Blacks would have ten times the number of white friends than they now have were they but half as much in earnest to secure their dearest rights as they are to ape the follies and extravagances of their white neighbors, and to indulge in idle show, in ease, and in luxury." Upon leaving Springfield in 1850, he instructed the League to act, "...quickly, quietly, and efficiently," to protect slaves that escaped to Springfield. Words that would foreshadow Brown's later actions preceding Harper's Ferry. From Brown's founding of the League of Gileadites onward, not one person was ever taken back into slavery from Springfield. Brown gave his rocking chair to the mother of his beloved black porter, Thomas Thomas, as a gesture of affection. Some popular narrators have exaggerated the unfortunate demise of Brown and Perkins Wool Commission in Springfield along with Brown's later life choices. In actuality, Perkins absorbed much of the financial loss, and their partnership continued for several more years, with Brown nearly breaking even by 1854. Brown's time in Springfield sowed the seeds for the future financial support he received from New England's great merchants, introduced him to nationally famous abolitionists like Douglas and Truth, and included the foundation of the League of Gileadites. During this time, Brown also helped publicize David Walker's speech appeal. Brown's personal attitudes evolved in Springfield, as he observed the success of the city's Underground Railroad and made his first venture into militant, anti-slavery community organizing. In speeches, he pointed to the martyrs Elijah Lovejoy and Charles Turner Torrey as whites, ready to help blacks challenge slave catchers. In Springfield, Brown found a city that shared his own anti-slavery passions, and each seemed to educate the other. Certainly, with both successes and failures, Brown's Springfield years were a transformative period of his life that catalyzed many of his later actions. <laughs> Homestead in New York In 1848, Brown heard of Jarrett Smith's Adirondack land grants to poor black men, and decided to move his family among the new settlers. He bought land near North Elba, New York, near Lake Placid, for $1 an acre, $2 per hectare, and spent two years there. After he was executed, his wife took his body there for burial. Since 1895, the farm has been owned by New York State. The John Brown Farm and Gravesite is now a National Historic Landmark. Topic: <laughs> Actions in Kansas. In 1855, Brown learned from his adult sons in the Kansas Territory that their families were completely unprepared to face attack, and that pro-slavery forces there were militant. Determined to protect his family and oppose the advances of slavery supporters, Brown left for Kansas, enlisting a son-in-law and making several stops just to collect funds and weapons. As reported by the New York Tribune, Brown stopped en route to participate in an anti-slavery convention that took place in June 1855 in Albany, New York. Despite the controversy that ensued on the convention floor regarding the support of violent efforts on behalf of the Free State cause, several people gave Brown financial support. As he went westward, Brown found more militant support in his home state of Ohio, particularly in the strongly anti-slavery Western Reserve section where he had been reared. Potawatomi 
Brown and the free settlers were optimistic that they could bring Kansas into the Union as a slavery-free state. After the winter snows thawed in 1856, the pro-slavery activists began a campaign to seize Kansas on their own terms. Brown was particularly affected by the sacking of Lawrence in May 1856, in which a sheriff-led posse destroyed newspaper offices and a hotel. Only one man, a border ruffian, was killed. Preston Brooks's caning of anti-slavery Senator Charles Sumner in the United States Senate also fueled Brown's anger. A pro-slavery writer, Benjamin Franklin Stringfellow, of the Squatter Sovereign, wrote that pro-slavery forces are determined to repel this northern invasion, and make Kansas a slave state, though our rivers should be covered with the blood of their victims, and the carcasses of the abolitionists should be so numerous in the territory as to breed disease and sickness, we will not be deterred from our purpose. Brown was outraged by both the violence of the pro-slavery forces and what he saw as a weak and cowardly response by the anti-slavery partisans and the free state settlers, whom he described as cowards, or worse. Brown's beloved father, Owen, died on May 8, 1856. Correspondence indicates that John Brown and his family received word of his death around the same time. Brown conducted surveillance on encamped ruffians in his vicinity and learned that his family was marked for attack, and furthermore was given supposedly reliable information as to pro-slavery neighbors who had aligned and supported these forces. Speaking of the threats that were supposedly the justification for the massacre, Free State leader Charles L. Robinson stated, When it is known that such threats were as plenty as blueberries in June, on both sides, all over the territory, and were regarded as of no more importance than the idle wind, this indictment will hardly justify midnight assassination of all pro-slavery men, whether making threats or not. Had all men been killed in Kansas who indulged in such threats, there would have been none left to bury the dead. In the two years prior to the Pottawatomie Creek Massacre, there had been eight killings in Kansas Territory attributable to slavery politics, but none in the vicinity of the massacre. The massacre was the match in the powder keg that precipitated the bloodiest period in Bleeding Kansas history, a three-month period of retaliatory raids and battles in which 29 people died. Topic. Palmyra and Osawatomie. A force of Missourians, led by Captain Henry Pate, captured John Jr. and Jason, and destroyed the Brown family homestead, and later participated in the sack of Lawrence. On June 2, John Brown, nine of his followers, and twenty local men successfully defended a free state settlement at Palmyra, Kansas against an attack by Pate see Battle of Black Jack. Pate and twenty-two of his men were taken prisoner. After capture, they were taken to Brown's camp, and received all the food Brown could find. Brown forced Pate to sign a treaty, exchanging the freedom of Pate and his men for the promised release of Brown's two captured sons. Brown released Pate to Colonel Edwin Sumner, but was furious to discover that the release of his sons was delayed until September. In August, a company of over 300 Missourians under the command of General John W. Reed crossed into Kansas and headed towards Osawatomie, intending to destroy the Free State settlements there, and then march on Topeka and Lawrence. On the morning of August 30, 1856, they shot and killed Brown's son Frederick and his neighbor David Garrison on the outskirts of Osawatomie. Brown, outnumbered more than seven to one, arranged his 38 men behind natural defenses along the road. Firing from cover, they managed to kill at least 20 of Reed's men and wounded 40 more. Reed regrouped, ordering his men to dismount and charge into the woods. Brown's small group scattered and fled across the Mare de Signas River. One of Brown's men was killed during the retreat and four were captured. While Brown and his surviving men hid in the woods nearby, the Missourians plundered and burned Osawatomie. Despite his defeat, Brown's bravery and military shrewdness in the face of overwhelming odds brought him national attention and made him a hero to many northern abolitionists. On September 7, Brown entered Lawrence to meet with free state leaders and help fortify against a feared assault. At least 2,700 pro slavery Missourians were once again invading Kansas. On September 14, they skirmished near Lawrence. Brown prepared for battle, but serious violence was averted when the new governor of Kansas, John W. Geary, ordered the warring parties to disarm and disband, and offered clemency to former fighters on both sides. Brown, taking advantage of the fragile peace, left Kansas with three of his sons to raise money from supporters in the north. <laughs> 
Topic: <laughs> Later years. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Gathering forces. Brown returned to the East by November 1856, and spent the next two years in New England raising funds. Initially he returned to Springfield, where he received contributions, and also a letter of recommendation from a prominent and wealthy merchant, George Walker. Walker was the brother-in-law of Franklin Benjamin Sanborn, the secretary for the Massachusetts State Kansas Committee, who introduced Brown to several influential abolitionists in the Boston area in January 1857. Amos Adams Lawrence, a prominent Boston merchant, secretly gave a large amount of cash. William Lloyd Garrison, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, Theodore Parker and George Luther Stearns, and Samuel Gridley Howe also supported Brown. A group of six wealthy abolitionists, Sanborn, Higginson, Parker, Stearns, Howe, and Jarrett Smith, agreed to offer Brown financial support for his anti-slavery activities. They eventually provided most of the financial backing for the raid on Harper's Ferry, and came to be known as the Secret Six or the Committee of Six. Brown often requested help from them with, No questions asked. And it remains unclear how much of Brown's scheme the Secret Six were aware of. On January 7, 1858, the Massachusetts Committee pledged to provide 200 Sharps rifles and ammunition, which were being stored at Tabor, Iowa. In March, Brown contracted Charles Blair of Collinsville, Connecticut for 1,000 pikes. In the following months, Brown continued to raise funds, visiting Worcester, Springfield, New Haven, Syracuse, and Boston. In Boston, he met Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson. He received many pledges but little cash. In March, while in New York City, he was introduced to Hugh Forbes, an English mercenary, who had experience as a military tactician fighting with Giuseppe Garibaldi in Italy in 1848. Brown hired him as his men's drillmaster and to write their tactical handbook. They agreed to meet in Tabor that summer. Using the alias Nelson Hawkins, Brown traveled through the Northeast and then visited his family in Hudson, Ohio. On August 7, he arrived in Tabor. Forbes arrived two days later. Over several weeks, the two men put together a well-matured plan for fighting slavery in the South. The men quarreled over many of the details. In November, their troops left for Kansas. Forbes had not received his salary and was still feuding with Brown, so he returned to the East instead of venturing into Kansas. He soon threatened to expose the plot to the government. As the October election saw a free state victory, Kansas was quiet. Brown made his men return to Iowa, where he told them tidbits of his Virginia scheme. In January 1858, Brown left his men in Springdale, Iowa, and set off to visit Frederick Douglass in Rochester, New York. There he discussed his plans with Douglass, and reconsidered Forbes's criticisms. Brown wrote a provisional constitution that would create a government for a new state in the region of his invasion. He then traveled to Peterborough, New York, and Boston to discuss matters with the Secret Six. In letters to them, he indicated that, along with recruits, he would go into the South equipped with weapons to do Kansas work. Brown and twelve of his followers, including his son Owen, traveled to Chatham, Ontario, where he convened on May 10 a constitutional convention. The convention, with several dozen delegates including his friend James Madison Bell, was put together with the help of Dr. Martin Delany. One third of Chatham's 6,000 residents were fugitive slaves, and it was here that Brown was introduced to Harriet Tubman. The convention assembled 34 blacks and 12 whites to adopt Brown's provisional constitution. According to Delany, during the convention, Brown illuminated his plans to make Kansas rather than Canada the end of the Underground Railroad. This would be the subterranean passway. Delany's reflections are not entirely trustworthy. Brown was no longer looking toward Kansas and was entirely focused on Virginia. Other testimony from the Chatham meeting suggests Brown did speak of going south. Brown had long used the terminology of the subterranean passway from the late 1840s, so it is possible that Delany conflated Brown's statements over the years. Regardless, Brown was elected commander-in-chief and named John Henry Caggy his Secretary of War. Richard Rielf was named Secretary of State. Elder Monroe, a black minister, was to act as president until another was chosen. A. M. Chapman was the acting vice president, Delany, the corresponding secretary. In 1859, a declaration of liberty by the representatives of the slave population of the United States of America 
was written, although nearly all of the delegates signed the Constitution, very few volunteered to join Brown's forces, although it will never be clear how many Canadian expatriates actually intended to join Brown because of a subsequent security leak that threw off plans for the raid, creating a hiatus in which Brown lost contact with many of the Canadian leaders. This crisis occurred when Hugh Forbes, Brown's mercenary, tried to expose the plans to Massachusetts Senator Henry Wilson and others. The Secret Six feared their names would be made public. Howe and Higginson wanted no delays in Brown's progress, while Parker, Stearns, Smith and Sanborn insisted on postponement. Stearns and Smith were the major sources of funds, and their words carried more weight. To throw Forbes off the trail and invalidate his assertions, Brown returned to Kansas in June, and remained in that vicinity for six months. There he joined forces with James Montgomery, who was leading raids into Missouri. On December 20, Brown led his own raid, in which he liberated eleven slaves, took captive two white men, and looted horses and wagons. On January 20, 1859, he embarked on a lengthy journey to take the liberated slaves to Detroit and then on a ferry to Canada. While passing through Chicago, Brown met with abolitionists Alan Pinkerton, John Jones, and Henry O. Wagoner who arranged and raised the fare for the passage to Detroit and purchased clothes and supplies for Brown. Jones's wife, Mary, guessed that the supplies included the suit Brown was later hanged in. On March 12, 1859, Brown met with Frederick Douglass and Detroit abolitionists George D. Baptiste, William Lambert, and others at William Webb's house in Detroit to discuss emancipation. De Baptiste proposed that conspirators blow up some of the South's largest churches. The suggestion was opposed by Brown, who felt humanity precluded such unnecessary bloodshed. Over the course of the next few months, he traveled again through Ohio, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts to drum up more support for the cause. On May 9, he delivered a lecture in Concord, Massachusetts, that Amos Bronson Alcott, Emerson, and Thoreau attended. Brown reconnoitered with the Secret Six. In June he paid his last visit to his family in North Elba before departing for Harper's Ferry. He stayed one night en route in Hagerstown, Maryland at the Washington House, on West Washington Street. On June 30, 1859, the hotel had at least 25 guests, including I. Smith and Sons, Oliver Smith and Owen Smith, and Jeremiah Anderson, all from New York. From papers found in the Kennedy farmhouse after the raid, it is known that Brown wrote to Kagi that he would sign into a hotel as I. Smith & Sons. Topic raid As he began recruiting supporters for an attack on slaveholders, Brown was joined by Harriet Tubman, General Tubman, as he called her. Her knowledge of support networks and resources in the border states of Pennsylvania, Maryland and Delaware was invaluable to Brown and his planners. Some abolitionists, including Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, opposed his tactics, but Brown dreamed of fighting to create a new state for freed slaves and made preparations for military action. After he began the first battle, he believed, slaves would rise up and carry out a rebellion across the South. Brown asked Tubman to gather former slaves then living in present-day southern Ontario who might be willing to join his fighting force, which she did. He arrived in Harper's Ferry on July 3, 1859. A few days later, under the name Isaac Smith, he rented a farmhouse in nearby Maryland. He awaited the arrival of his recruits. They never materialized in the numbers he expected. In late August he met with Douglas in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, where he revealed the Harper's Ferry plan. Douglas expressed severe reservations, rebuffing Brown's pleas to join the mission. Douglas had known of Brown's plan since early 1859 and had made a number of efforts to discourage blacks from enlisting. In late September, the 950 Pikes arrived from Charles Blair. Caggy's draft plan called for a brigade of 4,500 men, but Brown had only 21 men 16 white and 5 black, 3 free blacks, 1 freed slave, and a fugitive slave. They ranged in age from 21 to 49. Twelve had been with Brown in Kansas raids. On October 16, 1859, Brown, leaving three men behind as a rear guard, led 18 men in an attack on the Harper's Ferry Armory. He had received 200 Beecher's Bibles, breechloading .52 .2 mm caliber Sharps rifles, and pikes from northern abolitionist societies in preparation for the raid. The armory was a large complex of buildings that contained 100,000 muskets and rifles, which Brown planned to seize and use to arm local slaves. They would then head south, drawing off more and more slaves from plantations, and fighting only in self-defense. 
As Douglas and Brown's family testified, his strategy was essentially to deplete Virginia of its slaves, causing the institution to collapse in one county after another, until the movement spread into the South, wreaking havoc on the economic viability of the pro slavery states. Initially, the raid went well, and they met no resistance entering the town. They cut the telegraph wires and easily captured the armory, which was being defended by a single watchman. They next rounded up hostages from nearby farms, including Colonel Lewis Washington, great-grandnephew of George Washington. They also spread the news to the local slaves that their liberation was at hand. Things started to go wrong when an eastbound Baltimore and Ohio train approached the town. The train's baggage master tried to warn the passengers. Brown's men yelled for him to halt and then opened fire. The baggage master, Hayward Shepard, became the first casualty of Brown's war against slavery. Ironically, Shepard was a free black man. Two of the hostages' slaves also died in the raid. For some reason, after the shooting of Shepard, Brown allowed the train to continue on its way. A. J. Phelps, the through express passenger train conductor, sent a telegram to W. P. Smith, Master of Transportation of the B. and O. R. R., Baltimore, Monocacy, 7.05 a.m., October 17, 1859. Express train bound east, under my charge, was stopped this morning at Harper's Ferry by armed abolitionists. They have possession of the bridge and the arms and armory of the United States. Myself and baggage master have been fired at, and Hayward, the colored porter, is wounded very severely, being shot through the body, the ball entering the body below the left shoulder blade and coming out under the left side. News of the raid reached Baltimore early that morning and Washington by late morning. In the meantime, local farmers, shopkeepers, and militia pinned down the raiders in the armory by firing from the heights behind the town. Some of the local men were shot by Brown's men. At noon, a company of militia seized the bridge, blocking the only escape route. Brown then moved his prisoners and remaining raiders into the engine house, a small brick building at the armory's entrance. He had the doors and windows barred and loopholes cut through the brick walls. The surrounding forces barraged the engine house, and the men inside fired back with occasional fury. Brown sent his son Watson and another supporter out under a white flag, but the angry crowd shot them. Intermittent shooting then broke out, and Brown's son Oliver was wounded. His son begged his father to kill him and end his suffering, but Brown said, If you must die, die like a man. A few minutes later, Oliver was dead. The exchanges lasted throughout the day. By the morning of October 18 the engine house, later known as John Brown's Fort, was surrounded by a company of U.S. Marines under the command of First Lieutenant Israel Green, USMC, with Colonel Robert E. Lee of the United States Army in overall command. Army First Lieutenant J.E.B. Stewart approached under a white flag and told the raiders their lives would be spared if they surrendered. Brown refused, saying, No, I prefer to die here. Stewart then gave a signal. The Marines used sledgehammers and a makeshift battering ram to break down the engine room door. Lieutenant Israel Green cornered Brown and struck him several times, wounding his head. In three minutes Brown and the survivors were captives, altogether Brown's men killed four people, and wounded nine. Ten of Brown's men were killed, including his sons Watson and Oliver. Five escaped, including his son Owen, and seven were captured along with Brown. Among the raiders killed were John Henry Caggy, Louis Sheridan Leary and Dangerfield Newby, those hanged besides Brown included John Anthony Copeland Jr. and Shields Green. Imprisonment, trial, and six weeks in jail Brown and the others captured were held in the office of the armory. On October 18, 1859, Virginia Governor Henry A. Wise, Virginia Senator James M. Mason, and Representative Clement Vallandigham of Ohio arrived in Harper's Ferry. Mason led the three-hour questioning session of Brown. Although the attack had taken place on federal property, Wise ordered that Brown and his men be tried in Virginia in Charlestown, the nearby seat of Jefferson County just seven miles west of Harper's Ferry, perhaps to avert northern political pressure on the federal government, or in the unlikely event of a presidential pardon. The trial began October 27, after a doctor pronounced the still-wounded Brown fit for trial. Brown was charged with murdering four whites and a black, conspiring with slaves to rebel, and treason against Virginia. 
A series of lawyers were assigned to him, including Lawson Botts, Thomas C. Green, Samuel Chilton, a lawyer from Washington, D.C., and George Hoyt, but it was Hiram Griswold, a lawyer from Cleveland, Ohio, who concluded the defense on October 31. In his closing statement, Griswold argued that Brown could not be found guilty of treason against a state to which he owed no loyalty and of which he was not a resident, that Brown had not killed anyone himself, and that the raid's failure indicated that Brown had not conspired with slaves. Andrew Hunter, the local district attorney, presented the closing arguments for the prosecution. On November 2, after a week-long trial and 45 minutes of deliberation, the Charlestown jury found Brown guilty on all three counts. He was sentenced to be hanged in public on December 2. In response to the sentence, Ralph Waldo Emerson remarked that, John Brown will make the gallows glorious like the cross. Cadets from the Virginia Military Institute under the leadership of General Francis H. Smith and Major Thomas J. Jackson, who earned the nickname Stonewall, less than two years later were called into service as a security detail in the event Brown's supporters attempted a rescue. During the month before his execution, Brown was allowed to send and receive correspondence. One of the letters was from Mahala Doyle, wife and mother of three of Brown's Kansas victims. She wrote, Although, vengeance is not mine, I confess that I do feel gratified to hear that you were stopped in your fiendish career at Harper's Ferry. In a postscript she added, my son John Doyle whose life I beg G. Ed of you is now grown up and is very desirous to be in Charlestown on the day of your execution." Brown refused to be rescued by Silas Soule, a friend from Kansas who somehow infiltrated the Jefferson County Jail one day and offered to break him out during the night and flee northward to New York State and possibly Canada. Brown supposedly told Silas that, aged 59, he was too old to live a life on the run from the federal authorities as a fugitive and that he was ready to die as a martyr. Silas left him behind to be executed. Many of Brown's letters exuded spirituality and conviction and, when picked up by the northern press, won him more supporters in the north while infuriating many white people in the south. On December 1, Brown's wife arrived by train in Charlestown, where she joined him at the county jail for his last meal. She was denied permission to stay the night, prompting Brown to lose his composure and temper for the only time during the ordeal. The governor of Virginia was so concerned about an attempt to rescue Brown that he halted almost all transportation on the Winchester and Potomac Railroad north from Charlestown through Harper's Ferry into Maryland from the day before through the day after the execution see Winchester and Potomac Railroad hashtag John Brown's Raid. Victor Hugo's reaction Victor Hugo, from exile on Guernsey, tried to obtain pardon for John Brown. He sent an open letter that was published by the press on both sides of the Atlantic cf. Acts at Paroles. This text, written at Hauteville House on December 2, 1859, warned of a possible civil war. Politically speaking, the murder of John Brown would be an uncorrectable sin. It would create in the Union a latent fissure that would in the long run dislocate it. Brown's agony might perhaps consolidate slavery in Virginia, but it would certainly shake the whole American democracy. You save your shame, but you kill your glory. Morally speaking, it seems a part of the human light would put itself out, that the very notion of justice and injustice would hide itself in darkness, on that day where one would see the assassination of emancipation by liberty itself. Let America know and ponder on this, there is something more frightening than Cain killing Abel, and that is Washington killing Spartacus. The letter was initially published in the London News and was widely reprinted. After Brown's execution, Hugo wrote a number of additional letters about Brown and the abolitionist cause. Abolitionists in the United States saw Hugo's writings as evidence of international support for the anti-slavery cause. The most widely publicized commentary on Brown to reach America from Europe was an 1861 pamphlet, John Brown par Victor Hugo, that included a brief biography and reprinted two letters by Hugo, including that of December 9, 1859. The pamphlet's frontispiece was an engraving of a hanged man by Hugo that became widely associated with the execution. Death and aftermath. On the morning of December 2, 1859, Brown wrote, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. 
I had, as I now think, vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed it might be done. He read his Bible and wrote a final letter to his wife, which included his will. At 11 a.m. he was escorted from the county jail through a crowd of 2,000 soldiers a few blocks away to a small field where the gallows were. Among the soldiers in the crowd were future Confederate General Stonewall Jackson and John Wilkes Booth the latter borrowing a militia uniform to gain admission to the execution. The poet Walt Whitman, in Year of Meteors, described viewing the execution. Brown was accompanied by the sheriff and his assistants, but no minister since he had consistently rejected the ministrations of pro slavery clergy. Since the region was in the grips of virtual hysteria, most Northerners, including journalists, were run out of town, and it is unlikely any anti slavery clergyman would have been safe, even if one were to have sought to visit Brown. He elected to receive no religious services in the jail or at the scaffold. He was hanged at 11.15 a.m. and pronounced dead at 11.50 a.m. Transportation of his body Brown's body was placed in a wooden coffin with the noose still around his neck. His coffin was then put on a train to take it away from Virginia to his family homestead in New York for burial. His body was supposed to be embalmed in Philadelphia, through which the train would pass. However, because of demonstrations expected from both sides—there were many Southern pro-slavery medical students in Philadelphia—Mayor Alexander Henry made a fake casket, covered with flowers and flags which was carefully lifted from the coach and the train and sped onward in its destination. In reality the train carrying Brown's body never actually stopped in Philadelphia, and thus violence was averted by a sham coffin. As a direct result, many Southern medical students and professors left Philadelphia en masse on December 21, 1859, for Southern medical schools, never to return. In the North, large memorial meetings took place, church bells rang, minute guns were fired, and famous writers such as Emerson and Thoreau joined many Northerners in praising Brown. Topic. Senate investigation On December 14, 1859, the U.S. Senate appointed a bipartisan committee to investigate the Harper's Ferry Raid and to determine whether any citizens contributed arms, ammunition or money to John Brown's men. The Democrats attempted to implicate the Republicans in the raid, the Republicans tried to disassociate themselves from Brown and his acts. The Senate committee heard testimony from 32 witnesses, including Liam Dodson, one of the surviving abolitionists. The report, authored by Chairman James Murray Mason, a pro-slavery Democrat from Virginia, was published in June 1860. It found no direct evidence of a conspiracy, but implied that the raid was a result of Republican doctrines. The two committee Republicans published a minority report, but were apparently more concerned about denying Northern culpability than clarifying the nature of Brown's efforts. Republicans such as Abraham Lincoln rejected any connection with the raid, calling Brown insane. The investigation was performed in a tense environment in both houses of Congress. One senator wrote to his wife that the members on both sides are mostly armed with deadly weapons, and it is said that the friends of each are armed in the galleries. After a heated exchange of insults, a Mississippian attacked Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania with a Bowie knife in the House of Representatives. Stevens' friends prevented a fight. The Senate committee was very cautious in its questions of two of Brown's backers, Samuel Howe and George Stearns, out of fear of stoking violence. Howe and Stearns later said that the questions were asked in a manner that permitted them to give honest answers without implicating themselves. Civil War historian James M. McPherson stated that a historian reading their testimony, however, will be convinced that they told several falsehoods. <laughs> Aftermath of the raid The raid on Harper's Ferry is generally thought to have done much to set the nation on a course toward civil war. Southern slave owners, hearing initial reports that hundreds of abolitionists were involved, were relieved the effort was so small, but feared other abolitionists would emulate Brown and attempt to lead slave rebellions. Therefore, the South reorganized the decrepit militia system. 
These militias, well established by 1861, became a ready made Confederate army, making the South better prepared for war. Southern Democrats charged that Brown's raid was an inevitable consequence of the Republican Party's political platform, which they associated with abolitionism. In light of the upcoming elections in November 1860, the Republicans tried to distance themselves as much as possible from Brown, condemning the raid and dismissing its leader as an insane fanatic. As one historian explains, Brown was successful in polarizing politics. Brown's raid succeeded brilliantly. It drove a wedge through the already tentative and fragile opposition Republican coalition and helped to intensify the sectional polarization that soon tore the Democratic Party and the Union apart. Many abolitionists in the North viewed Brown as a martyr, sacrificed for the sins of the nation. Immediately after the raid, William Lloyd Garrison published a column in The Liberator, judging Brown's raid, "...well intended but sadly misguided," and "...wild and futile." But he defended Brown's character from detractors in the northern and southern press and argued that those who supported the principles of the American Revolution could not consistently oppose Brown's raid. On the day Brown was hanged, Garrison reiterated the point in Boston, "...whenever commenced, I cannot but wish success to all slave insurrections." After the Civil War, Frederick Douglass wrote, His zeal in the cause of my race was far greater than mine. It was as the burning sun to my taper light. Mine was bounded by time, his stretched away to the boundless shores of eternity. I could live for the slave, but he could die for him. Legacy Monuments On the second floor of the Kansas State Capitol in Topeka, there is a large mural of Brown by John Stuart Curry titled Tragic Prelude. It portrays Brown with a Bible in one hand, a rifle in the other, between Union and Confederate forces, with a tornado in the background. It was not well received. Kansas City, Kansas, at the Kandaro townsite, 27th and Sewell, a pillar with a statue of Brown. Lettering reads, Erected to the memory of John Brown by a grateful people. There is a bronze plaque. Kandaro was a major stop on the Underground Railroad. In March, 2018, the statue was defaced with swastikas and Hail Satan. At the John Brown Farm State Historic Site near Lake Placid, New York, on John Brown Road, is a larger-than-life statue of Brown escorting a black child to freedom. The artist was Joseph Polia. Brown's tombstone is enclosed in glass. The cabin he lived in while in Kansas is the John Brown Museum, also known as the John Brown Museum State Historic Site and John Brown Cabin. It is in Osawatomie, Kansas, in the John Brown Memorial Park. There is also a bronze statue of Brown, with a plaque. The wagon that carried Brown from jail to his execution is preserved by the Jefferson County West Virginia Museum in Charlestown. An approximate replica of the firehouse was built in 2012 at the Discovery Park of America Museum Park in Union City, Tennessee. There is a marker explaining the link with John Brown's raid. There is an unmarked obelisk at the site of the building called John Brown's Fort, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. There is a historical marker. Iowa has set up the John Brown Freedom Trail, marking his journey across Iowa leaving Kansas, en route to Chatham, Ontario, and then Harper's Ferry, Lewis, Iowa. Fighting Slavery, Aiding Runaways. John Brown Freedom Trail. December 20, 1858 to March 12, 1859. In Port-au-Prince, Haiti, Avenue John Brown is a main street. Topic. Historical markers According to the Historical Marker Database http colon slash slash hmdb.org, Brown is mentioned on the following historical markers At his birthplace in Torrington, Connecticut, on John Brown Road. Baldwin City, Kansas. Battle of Black Jack. Franklin County, Kansas, at the site of the Potawatomi Massacre. Lawrence, Kansas. John Brown and the Siege of Lawrence, September 14 to 15, 1856. Near Netawaka, Kansas, Battle of the Spurs. Osawatomie, Kansas. At the site of the Battle of Osawatomie in John Brown Memorial Park. Soldiers Monument. 
commemorating the five persons killed, including one of Brown's sons. This inscription is also in commemoration of the heroism of Capt. John Brown who commanded at the Battle of Osawatomie August 30, 1856, who died and conquered American slavery on the scaffold at Charlestown VA. December 2, 1859 John Brown Country 1935 plaque by the Women's Relief Corps, Department of Kansas Old Stone Church Marker Built by Rev. Samuel Adair Brother-in-law of John Brown. 1861. Topeka, Kansas. Capital of Kansas. In the late 1850s Negroes bound north on the Underground Railway were hidden here by John Brown. Near Trading Post, Kansas. Mare de Signas Massacre. Site of a fort. Built by Brown after the massacre. Murder on the Mare de Signas. Hagerstown, Maryland, at the site of the Washington House Hotel, where Brown stayed on his way to Harper's Ferry. Hyattsville, Maryland, Osborne Perry Anderson, who fought with Brown. Sharpsburg, Maryland, at the site of the Kennedy Farm. Marlboro, Massachusetts, at the John Brown Bell, once in Harper's Ferry, since 1892 on display in Marlboro. The second most famous American bell, after the Liberty Bell. Detroit, Michigan, at the house of William Webb, site of the Frederick Douglass, John Brown meeting. Hudson, Ohio, at his boyhood home. First Congregational Church in Hudson. At a November 1837 prayer meeting, church member and anti-slavery leader John Brown made his first public vow to destroy slavery. Another marker mentions Brown at the former site of the church. Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Abolitionist John Brown boards in Chambersburg. The greatest Sacre C.E. prelude to Gettysburg. In rural Crawford County, Pennsylvania, there is a John Brown Road, and on it two historical markers at the site of Brown's house and tannery. Indiana, Pennsylvania, marker for Absalom Albert Hazlitt, a member of Brown's party who was also hanged at Charlestown in 1860. King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, Valley Forge National Historic Park, Knox's Quarters, John Brown Farm, Mont Alto, Pennsylvania, John Brown Raid, where John Cook, one of Brown's followers, was captured. Two markers near Amisville, Virginia, Dangerfield Newby marker. Winchester, Virginia. A malicious design. Burning the Winchester Medical College. The body of John Brown's son Watson was brought there for dissection by medical students. Charlestown, West Virginia. Jefferson County Courthouse. Where John Brown was tried. Two treason trials. The other had nothing to do with Brown. Hanging site of John Brown. Creation of a martyr. Prelude to War John Brown Scaffold Site of the Execution of John Brown Edge Hill Cemetery — John Brown Raid Victims Bel Air, home of Colonel Lewis Washington, held hostage by Brown Focus of Action — Jefferson County in the Civil War Harper's Ferry, West Virginia Pilgrimage Marks the site of an 1896 visit by the National League of Colored Women. Holy Ground. Marks 1906 visit by members of the Niagara Movement, predecessor of the NAACP, on what they called John Brown Day, August 17. John Brown. Plaque erected in 1918 by the alumni of Storer College. John Brown. Plaque erected in 1932 by the NAACP. John Brown Fort. A Nation's Armory Arsenal Square For the Deposit of Arms John Brown Monument — on the site of the original location of John Brown's Fort John Brown's Last Stand — at the same location Allstadt House — John Brown's Hostages — Prelude to War The John Brown Raiders all those who participated in the raid. In honor of Private Luke Quinn. Killed during the dapture of John Brown. The Murphy Farm. Location of John Brown's fort between 1895 and 1910. 
Hayward Shepherd, another perspective. Hayward Shepherd. Chatham, Ontario. John Brown's Convention, 1858. Topic: <laughs> Views of contemporaries. Many black leaders of the time, Martin Delany, Henry Highland Garnet, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman. New and respected Brown, and black businesses across the North closed on the day of his execution. Shortly after Brown's death, Victor Hugo predicted it, would open a latent fissure that will finally split the Union asunder. And many poets responded to the event. In 1863 Julia Ward Howe wrote the popular hymn The Battle Hymn of the Republic to the tune of, John Brown's Body, which included a line, As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free analogizing Brown's sacrifice to that of Jesus Christ. Topic. Views of historians and other writers Writers continue to vigorously debate Brown's personality, sanity, motivations, morality, and relation to abolitionism. In his posthumous The Impending Crisis, 1848–1861 David Potter argued that the emotional effect of Brown's raid exceeded the philosophical effect of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and reaffirmed a deep division between North and South. Malcolm X said that white people could not join his black nationalist organization of Afro-American unity, but, if John Brown were still alive, we might accept him. Some writers describe Brown as a monomaniacal zealot, others as a hero. In 1931, the United Daughters of the Confederacy and Sons of Confederate Veterans erected a counter-monument, to Hayward Shepard, the free black man who became the first fatality of the Harper's Ferry Raid, claiming him, "...representative of Negroes of the neighborhood, who would not take part." By the mid-20th century, some scholars were fairly convinced that Brown was a fanatic and killer, while some African Americans sustained a positive view of him. Journalist Richard Owen Boyer considered Brown, "...an American who gave his life that millions of other Americans might be free." And others held similarly positive views. Several 21st century works about Brown are notable for the absence of hostility that characterized similar works a century earlier when Lincoln's anti-slavery views were de-emphasized. Journalist and documentary writer Ken Chowder considers Brown stubborn, egoistical, self-righteous, and sometimes deceitful, yet at certain times, a great man, and argues that Brown has been adopted by both the left and right, and his actions spun to fit the world view of the spinner at various times in American history. Toledo 2002, Peterson 2002, DeCaro 2002, 2007, Reynolds 2005, and Carton 2006 are critically appreciative of Brown's history, far from the opinions of earlier writers. The shift to an appreciative perspective moves many white historians toward the view long held by black scholars such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Benjamin Quarles, and Lerone Bennett, Jr. Topic. Historiography As the U.S. distanced itself from the anti-slavery cause and imposition of martial law in the South during Congressional Reconstruction, the historical view of Brown changed. In the 1880s, Brown's detractors—some of them contemporaries now embarrassed by their former fervent abolitionism— began to produce virulent exposés, particularly emphasizing the Potawatomi killings of 1856. Historian James Lawin surveyed American history textbooks circa 1995 and noted that until about 1890, historians considered Brown perfectly sane, but from about 1890 until 1970, he was generally portrayed as insane. Although Oswald Garrison Villard's 1910 biography of Brown was thought to be friendly, Villard being the grandson of abolitionist Garrison, he also added fuel to the anti Brown fire by criticizing him as a muddled, pugnacious, bumbling, and homicidal madman. Villard himself was a pacifist and admired Brown in many respects, but his interpretation of the facts provided a paradigm for later anti-Brown writers. Similarly, a 1923 textbook stated, "...the farther we get away from the excitement of 1859 the more we are disposed to consider this extraordinary man the victim of mental delusions." 
In 1978, NYU historian Albert Fried concluded that historians who portrayed Brown as a dysfunctional figure are really informing me of their predilections, their judgment of the historical event, their identification with the moderates and opposition to the extremists. This view of Brown has come to prevail in academic writing as well as in journalism. Biographer Louis DeCaro Jr. wrote in 2007, "...there is no consensus of fairness with respect to Brown in either the academy or the media." More recent portrayals of Brown as another Timothy McVeigh or Osama bin Laden may still reflect the same bias Fried discussed a generation ago. Some historians, such as Paul Finkelman, compare Brown to contemporary terrorists such as Osama bin Laden and Timothy McVeigh, Finkelman calling him, "...simply part of a very violent world," and further stating that Brown, "...is a bad tactician, a bad strategist, he's a bad planner, he's not a very good general. But he's not crazy." Historian James Gilbert labels Brown a terrorist by 21st century criteria. Gilbert writes, Brown's deeds conform to contemporary definitions of terrorism, and his psychological predispositions are consistent with the terrorist model. Biographer Stephen B. Oates has described Brown as, maligned as a demented dreamer, but, in fact, one of the most perceptive human beings of his generation. Biographer David S. Reynolds gives Brown credit for starting the Civil War or killing slavery and cautions others against identifying Brown with terrorism. Reynolds saw Brown as inspiring the civil rights movement a century later, adding, It is misleading to identify Brown with modern terrorists. Biographer Louis A. DeCaro, Jr., who has debunked many historical allegations about Brown's early life and public career, concludes that although he was hardly the only abolitionist to equate slavery with sin. His struggle against slavery was far more personal and religious than it was for many abolitionists, just as his respect and affection for black people was far more personal and religious than it was for most enemies of slavery. Historian and Brown documentary scholar Louis Ruchames wrote. Brown's action was one of great idealism and placed him in the company of the great liberators of mankind. Biographer Otto Scott introduced his work on Brown by writing, "...in the late 1850s a new type of political assassin appeared in the United States. He did not murder the mighty, but the obscure his purposes were the same as those of his classic predecessors, to force the nation into a new political pattern by creating terror." Lawyer Brian Harris writes, Whatever view you take of the consequences of Harper's Ferry, and for all that it was a botched job which resulted in the unnecessary deaths of innocents, it had at least the merit of having been undertaken for the noblest of motives. The same cannot be said for the sadistic butchery that was Potawatomi. It served no useful purpose other than to vent an old man's rage, and Brown is the smaller for it. In the arts. The two most noted screen portrayals of Brown were both given by actor Raymond Massey. The 1940 film Santa Fe Trail, starring Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland, depicted Brown completely unsympathetically as an out and out villainous madman. Massey added to that impression by playing him with a constant, wild eyed stare. The film gave the impression that it did not oppose slavery, even to the point of having a black, mammy character say, after an especially fierce battle. Mr. Brown done promised us freedom, but if this is freedom, I don't want no part of it." Massey portrayed Brown again in the little-known, low-budget Seven Angry Men, in which he was not only the main character, but depicted in a much more restrained, sympathetic way. Massey along with Tyrone Power and Judith Anderson starred in the acclaimed 1953 dramatic reading of Stephen Vincent Benet's epic Pulitzer Prize-winning poem John Brown's Body 1928. Three actors in formal dress recited and acted in a two-hour presentation of the poem. The production toured 60 cities in 28 states. In 1938-40, American painter John Stuart Curry painted Tragic Prelude left, a mural of Brown holding a gun and a Bible, in the Kansas State Capitol in Topeka. In 1941, Jacob Lawrence illustrated Brown's life in The Legend of John Brown, a series of 22 gouache paintings. 
By 1977, these were in such fragile condition that they could not be displayed, and the Detroit Institute of Arts had to commission Lawrence to recreate the series as silkscreen prints. The result was a limited edition portfolio of 22 hand screened prints, published with a poem, John Brown by Robert Hayden, commissioned specifically for the project. Though Brown had been a popular topic for many painters, The Legend of John Brown was the first series to explore his legacy from an African American perspective. Paintings such as Hovenden's The Last Moments of John Brown immortalize an apocryphal story in which a black woman offers the condemned Brown her baby to kiss on his way to the gallows. It was probably a tale invented by journalist James Redpath. Brown has also been the subject of several works of literature. Numerous American poets have written poems about him, including John Greenleaf Whittier, Louisa May Alcott, and Walt Whitman. The Polish poet Cyprian Camille Norwood wrote two poems praising Brown, John Brown, and the better known, Du Obiwatela Jonah Brown, to Citizen John Brown. Marching Song 1932 is an unpublished play about the legend of John Brown by Orson Welles. Russell Banks's 1998 biographical novel about Brown, Cloudsplitter, was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. It is narrated by Brown's surviving son Owen. James McBride's 2013 novel The Good Lord Bird tells Brown's story through the eyes of a young slave, Henry Shackleford, who accompanies Brown to Harper's Ferry. The novel won the 2013 National Book Award for Fiction. Topic. Influences The connection between John Brown's life and many of the slave uprisings in the Caribbean was clear from the outset. Brown was born during the period of the Haitian Revolution, which saw Haitian slaves revolting against the French. The role the revolution played in helping to formulate Brown's abolitionist views directly is not clear, however, the revolution had an obvious effect on the general view towards slavery in the northern United States. As W. E. B. Du Bois notes, the involvement of slaves in the American revolutions, as well as the upheaval in Haiti, and the new enthusiasm for human rights, led to a wave of emancipation which started in Vermont, swept through New England and Pennsylvania, ending finally in New York and New Jersey. This changed sentiment, which occurred during the late 18th and early 19th century, undoubtedly had a role in creating Brown's abolitionist opinion, during his upbringing. The 1839 slave insurrection aboard the Spanish ship La Amistad, off the coast of Cuba, provides a poignant example of John Brown's support and appeal towards Caribbean slave revolts. On La Amistad, Joseph Cinque and approximately 50 other slaves captured the ship, slated to transport them from Havana to Puerto Principe, Cuba in July 1839, and attempted to return to Africa. However, through trickery, the ship ended up in the United States, where Cinque and his men stood trial. Ultimately, the courts acquitted the men because at the time the international slave trade was illegal in the United States. According to Brown's daughter, Turner and Cinque stood first in esteem among Brown's black heroes. Furthermore, she noted Brown's admiration of Cinque's character and management in carrying his points with so little bloodshed. In 1850, Brown would refer affectionately to the revolt, in saying, "...nothing so charms the American people as personal bravery. Witness the case of Cinque's, of everlasting memory, on board the Amistad." The slave revolts of the Caribbean had a clear and important impact on Brown's views towards slavery and his staunch support of the most severe forms of abolitionism. However, this is not the most important part of the many revolts' legacy of influencing Brown. The specific knowledge John Brown gained from the tactics employed in the Haitian Revolution, and other Caribbean revolts, was of paramount importance when Brown turned his sights to the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. As Brown's cohort Richard Rielf explained to a committee of the 36th Congress, he had posted himself in relation to the wars of Toussaint Louverture. He had become thoroughly acquainted with the wars in Haiti and the islands roundabout. By studying the slave revolts of the Caribbean region, Brown learned a great deal about how to properly conduct guerrilla warfare. A key element to the prolonged success of this warfare was the establishment of maroon communities, which are essentially colonies of runaway slaves. As a contemporary article notes, Brown would use these establishments to retreat from and evade attacks he could not overcome. He would maintain and prolong a guerrilla war, of which Haiti afforded 
An example, the idea of creating maroon communities was the impetus for the creation of John Brown's Provisional Constitution and Ordinances for the People of the United States, which helped to detail how such communities would be governed. However, the idea of maroon colonies of slaves is not an idea exclusive to the Caribbean region. In fact, maroon communities riddled the southern United States between the mid-1600s and 1864, especially the Great Dismal Swamp region of Virginia and North Carolina. Similar to the Haitian Revolution, the Seminole Wars, fought in modern-day Florida, saw the involvement of Maroon communities, which although outnumbered by native allies were more effective fighters, although the Maroon colonies of North America undoubtedly had an effect on John Brown's plan, their impact paled in comparison to that of the Maroon communities in places like Haiti, Jamaica, and Suriname. Accounts by Brown's friends and cohorts prove this idea. Richard Rielf, a cohort of Brown in Kansas, noted that Brown not only studied the slave revolts in the Caribbean, but focused more specifically on the Maroons of Jamaica and those involved in Haiti's liberation. Brown's friend Richard Hinton similarly noted that Brown knew, by heart, the occurrences in Jamaica and Haiti. Thomas Wentworth Higginson, a cohort of Brown's and a member of the Secret Six, stated that Brown's plan involved getting together bands and families of fugitive slaves. And establish them permanently in those mountain fastnesses, like the Maroons of Jamaica and Suriname." Brown had planned for the Maroon colonies established to be «durable» and thus able to endure over a prolonged period of war. The similarities between John Brown's attempted insurrection and the Haitian Revolution, in both methods, motivations, and resolve, is still seen today as the main avenue in Haiti's capital Port-au-Prince is still named for Brown as a sign of solidarity. Topic. See also Bibliography of the American Civil War